Hi, it's Dwyer. It's Sunday, November the 3rd, 2019. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Let's give a postscript on Canelo's annexation of the light heavyweight title from Sergei Kovalev. Right now, let me just say, great fight. I thought it was a great fight. Canelo saved us from a lot of controversy. A lot of controversy. I had Kovalev winning the fight by at least a couple of rounds. I'm guessing there are a few distinct groups out there. Two of them are one group that appreciates footwork, a jab, ring generalship. I thought Kovalev had the big edge in each area. Right? And the other group that like power, that liked aggression, guy on his front foot, right, that appreciates counters to the body. And Canelo was certainly a master all night at countering to the body, right? But what I want people to understand is that the personalities of the fighters, um, the sentimental favorite in the moment, has a big impact on how we see this clash of styles, right? Huge fight in 1987, Leonard, the guy with the superior foot movement, the guy with the jab, the guy with the volume, right? The guy with the ring generalship, moving around the ring, uh, doing flurries late in rounds, determining the pace of the fight in moments, against Marvin Hagler on his front foot just like Canelo doing brilliant counters to the body working over Leonard's body having Leonard afraid to load up on punches just like Canelo right now here it's flipped a little bit back then the champion was the guy on his front foot countering to the body here Kovalev the champion is the guy who's going around the ring behind a jab, right? Forcing Canelo to walk into it, dictating when the guys engage. Well, back then we took Marvin's title. We didn't reward the guy on his front foot with lower volume. We'll talk about the volume, I know. They're going to tell you that the punch stat numbers or CompuBots numbers had Canelo uh, landing more power punches or something like that. From this seat, that's laughable. Right? I thought the jab was extremely effective by Kovalev. You throw a jab for a host of reasons. I don't believe that a jab has to land on a guy's face to be an effective punch. To me, any punch that gives you the advantage in the moment is effective. Right? A lot of guys will jab you on a bicep. They'll jab you on a shoulder. They'll hit you on your arms. Because the whole purpose of it is to create distance. To keep you off of them. To throw off your timing. To force you to have to deal with a shot. It doesn't have to be a thumping jab. It could strategically be a placeholder jab. The point is to force you to have to deal with it to slow down your assault. A guy who's trying to collapse the pocket, anything you throw at him that keeps him outside of the pocket, that disrupts his rhythm, that has his punches, and this was a theme in the fight. Coming up short, right? Canelo for at least the first half of the fight is having such a problem with distance that you'll notice he throws several left hands and power punches and they're short. He can't figure out where Kovalev is. Right, Kovalev is keeping him off with the jab. Canelo, counterpuncher, is timing the entry point. 
but he's fighting a taller man with a longer reach. So when Kovalev pulls back the jab after landing it, Canelo then would try to leap inside with his counter, and his counter would come up short. So I don't know how you look at that round. Chris Mannix, I have a great deal of respect for Chris Mannix, did not understand his scorecard in the slightest. Right? All I can say is when you watch a round and one guy is dictating where the fighters are, he's out maneuvering the other guy. In other words, Kovalev's here, he shoots a few jabs, Canelo tries to close, Ko Kovalev moves away. That's footwork, folks. Right? Kovalev's backing up, you see the ropes behind him, Kovalev pivots so Canelo, who wants to pin him on the ropes, can't pin him on the ropes. Meanwhile, Kovalev is throwing more punches that round. Canelo's timing is off. Canelo, a very explosive puncher, a guy with hand speed, looks slow and lost. Can't even land something meaningful. Folks, that's a round that Kovalev won. Chris Mannix after giving Kovalev the first two rounds, starts giving Canelo rounds. I didn't get it. Now understand, on Mannix's card, the fight is razor close. Right? I would argue that Mannix gives at least three rounds to Canelo. At least three rounds to Canelo. That he shouldn't have. Understand, too, this is a craft. It's boxing, not fighting. If I'm outmaneuvering you and I'm keeping you at the end of a jab, and because of the spacing and pacing I've set up, you're unable to land big shots. You're taken out of your offensive game. Well, then I've won the round. I don't have to hurt you. Neither of us has to be reeling after the round. If my strategy has you befuddled and I have the weapon, the jab, that's dictating the pacing of the fight and I'm using it to keep you at bay, then I've won the round. Now understand, here, just like with the Ray Leonard Hagler fight, it seems the judges forgot who was the champion. Right? Old timers <clears throat> understand the idea that to be the champ, you have to beat the champ. There can't be some photo finish round where the champ throws more punches, keeps you at bay, is out maneuvering you, right? Has your counters coming up short. There, there, there can't be rounds like that where the judges then say, you know what? I think this challenger did enough to take the champ's title or to at least win this round and to be a step closer to taking the champ's title. Right now, all I'm saying is this. If the round's close, <clears throat> it's either a draw or it should go to the champ. This isn't horse racing. You don't go to a photo finish. Either at the end of the fight you feel that the challenger has beaten the champ enough to warrant a change of the title or the challenger hasn't done so. Right? So make no mistake. I thought Kovalev had the lead. You saw the controversy brewing when they interviewed Buddy McGirt between rounds. And Buddy McGirt said, look, you know, this is Vegas. So I assume that they have Canelo ahead. Right? The Kovalev corner was already laying the seeds for a fight finish where had it gone the distance and had the last two rounds gone the way most of the fight had gone, I'm just telling you this morning you would have had a huge split in boxing. It would have been an outcry. 
Canelo has already faced Golovkin twice, right? There would have been an outcry for Crusher to get a rematch. I'm just telling you the fight was that good. The fight was that competitive. So, we get to what ends up being the last round of the fight. And let me just say a few points. Kovalev has a tell. Now, unfortunately, I'm a subscriber to the Zone, right? Let me also throw a red flag here. What the hell is the Zone doing starting this fight so late? What was that about? I mean, at one point I dozed off waiting for the fight, right? Let me just say that both ESPN Plus and the Zone need to clean it up, right? They need to post a time that the actual main event will start. Right? You can't keep people waiting an hour and 90 minutes past the point where the fight's supposed to start. It was so ridiculous. At one point, they went to Kovalev's locker room, and it looked like Kovalev was about to doze off himself. Looked like he was ready to walk in the ring, but he was waiting for the main event to start. Also, pay attention to time zones. Now, I'm here on the West Coast in the U.S., Man, when I see the time get past 8 o'clock, get past 8.30, I know people back east. Right? New York, Boston, Philly, Baltimore. I know that they're struggling with some ridiculous telecast that's going to take them very late into the night, early into the morning. I know the Midwest, Chicago. Houston, I know they're struggling. The zone needs to clean that up. Well, let me just say this. Last round. Golovkin, last round of this fight, right? Um, Kovalev has a tell. A lot of fighters do. If you look at the back of his head, you'll notice that his head starts to snap when he's tired and he can't gauge the speed of the punches coming at him. You'll notice his head starts to snap when he can't anticipate the punches. Right? Doesn't have the reflexes to get out of the way. So Canelo in that last round throws a few great punches and sees the snap on Kovalev's head. I believe Canelo, well before he goes over to the ropes, knew that Kovalev, who has a poker face, was hurt. At a minimum, was very tired. So then, Canelo, in a controversial fight that would have ended with at least 40% of the people feeling that Canelo had not done enough to take Kovalev's title. I'm just telling you today, today, if you're with a group of boxing fans who are old enough to remember Hagler Leonard, there's a sizable group who believes Hagler got robbed in that fight. Right? The real boxing history is written by the fans, not by official scorecards. So Canelo gets Kovalev over by the ropes. Kovalev's moving, but you notice behind him are the ropes. Now what's noteworthy in the exchange is how unrushed Canelo is. He had to know. In fact, you sense the urgency before this. He had to know that he needed to put a period at the end of the sentence. That he had to make this convincing that he needed a signature moment in this fight. A knockdown at least to silence the critics, the yahoos online like me, who were going to say, how could this guy, the challenger, get out thrown by the champ, by this margin, get hit with as many punches 
as this champion threw at him and take his title. So Canelo throws a right hand. It hurts Kovalev. Canelo then doesn't rush. This is the difference between being 19 and being 29 years of, old, uh, of age. Right? This is an experienced Canelo. Canelo doesn't rush. This isn't a guy who hurts an opponent, then gets overexcited, empties the gun, is throwing a lot of punches. Canelo doesn't rush. Hits him with the right hand. Kovalev gets hit with it, feels the power, moves toward Canelo's left. Canelo just slides over there. No rush whatsoever. Hits him with the best punch of the fight. It's the left hook that gets Kovalev visibly shaken. That's the best punch of the fight. So then, after he hits Kovalev with that punch, and Kovalev is visibly shaken, there's no rush on him, it's surgical. It's some of the best film of Canelo's entire career. Canelo just leans back, leans forward, throws a straight right hand. That's the end of the fight. Kovalev goes down. Russell Moore, who I thought did an A-plus job, the referee, immediately waves it off. Right? Kovalev was not going to beat the count of 10. More importantly, more importantly, Mora understood he had just been hit with something fierce. You didn't want him getting up. This was like Thomas Hearns getting up against Marvin Hagler at the end of that fight. You didn't want him getting up. You understood. This was a great fight. This was the proper ending. Right? Had Kovalev gotten up and had they allowed that fight to continue and Kovalev wasn't able to get up. It was the right call by Mora, but had he gotten up, he could have been killed. He's in against a fearsome puncher. By the way, that's the other story of this fight. Here is Canelo moonlighting at light heavyweight. And my God, the punching power was magnificent. Was magnificent. Explosive, hard, it's Canelo, folks. Accurate. Right? So, let's just leave with some closing thoughts here. Let me say this. They interview the fighters afterwards. Golovkin, on camera, says, Hey, I was tired after the sixth round. Now, good for us. We cashed our ticket, right? I said, look, Golovkin's going to make it through the first six. Right? He did. <laughs> <laughs> by a few rounds he did right with these odds you should have been able to squeeze some juice out the orange right so that was great but he said he said that he was tired after the first six rounds now what I want to do here was to pivot toward the upcoming heavyweight title fight there's an interview of Tyson Fury talking about Anthony Joshua and he says, you know, in the rematch, Joshua's going to try to dance for 12 rounds like I do. Right? Then Fury goes further and says, he has to realize that that's something you have to be built for. You have to have developed that skill throughout your career. Right? These are my words, not Tyson Fury's. He's a bit more colorful with language. But he, he basically is predicting that Joshua is going to try to stay away from Andy Ruiz and that he's going to fail because he's going to become gassed. Right? Tyson Fury is expecting, as am I, Andy Ruiz, to catch up with Joshua. Right? I think Joshua is going to lose it. I think Joshua loses the rematch. Well, here you had Kovalev moving a lot. You knew it wasn't his game. He's moving a lot against Canelo. While he has a full tank of gas, guess what? He's winning rounds. Sorry, Chris Maddox. He wins more than the first two rounds out of the first four. Come on. He's, he's winning rounds. 
I ask everyone to revisit the third round, for example. That's a clear Kovalev round. Right, the fourth round. I, I thought Kovalev starts the fight in such a way where if you're a judge, you would have to say, wow, Canelo has his work cut out. I gave, I gave Kovalev the first three rounds. So Kovalev over the last nine just had to win three and not hit the canvas <laughs> to retain his title, right? If it's a draw, the champ keeps his title, right? But understand what happens. You're in the ring with a style geared for this opponent. You've had a full training camp, but this hasn't been your career. You weren't a mover in your early 20s. You weren't a mover in your mid-20s. You weren't a mover in your early 30s. Right? At some point, your body starts to say, player, we're overheating. Hey, man, the car is shutting down. We were built for one time around the track, not two times around the track at this speed. Right? So Kovalev, you notice Canelo can't get close to Kovalev early. Then Canelo starts to get close. Canelo starts to land counters to the body. Right, Kovalev's able to move away at times, but you notice Canelo's a lot closer in round seven than he is in round three. Right, I think that's going to happen to Anthony Joshua, personally. I think Andy Ruiz, the big underdog in Vegas, wins that rematch. Right here, the bottom line is, with the extra weight, Canelo, his first time at 175 pounds, had more stamina than Kovalev. Had more stamina. Let's also talk about the right hand. Now, I'll agree with those who say, look, if you're going to shoot a jab, right, and Emmanuel Stewart would have you using that jab to set up the Thomas Hearns right hand, the Lennox Lewis right hand, the Vladimir Klitschko right hand, all Emmanuel Stewart disciples. Here you were watching Kovalev set it up, right? He has a jab working, but then you didn't see the Kovalev right hand. Right? That part of the equation was missing. Well, that's what a great left hook from an opponent does to you. Canelo's left hook, we saw it. <laughs> that last round, that's the fight, folks. The threat of Canelo's left hook and Canelo's explosive, episodic, we'll call it, hand speed. I don't view his hand speed like I view Andy Ruiz's hand speed, right? Andy's hands are always fast. Andy's like Ray Leonard. With Canelo, it's episodic hand speed. He can go from 0 to 60 quickly, right? Off a power shot when he's ready. Well, Buddy McGirt and Kovalev didn't want Kovalev getting hit by that left. You saw the power of it in the last round of this fight. So Kovalev's keeping his right hand home, even without throwing that left hook. Canelo disarmed a big weapon of Kovalev's. That's boxing. Now let's segue away from the zone for a moment. Because I thought they started saying some things that were questionable. They talked about future opponents for Canelo. And one of the guys on the zone said, Hey, Arthur Perturbiev is just too big for Canelo. Right? Brian Kenny, who seems to be completely unaware of Dwight Cowie, a guy who was smaller than Canelo, who had the light heavyweight title, and then who moved up to cruiserweight. Right? These guys these guys act like 5'8 Canelo is the smallest guy ever, ever, to excel at light heavy. Folks, there have been others. There have been smaller guys. Gee, how could anyone look at Canelo's punching power and feel that he's out of his depth at light heavyweight? What are these guys thinking about? So, let me just say this. 
And and my daughter's in the room here. Okay, okay. Let me just say this. I'm going to have to hustle off a little bit quicker in this video than I thought. But let me just say, and yes, she likes the cameras, you can imagine. But let me just say this. Paterbiev is the perfect opponent for Canelo. Because Canelo had to go find Kovalev. Paterbiev's going to try to find him. Right? Canelo wants a guy to try to collapse the pocket on him. I'm not convinced Paterbiev hits harder than Canelo. I think Canelo wants a shootout. I think Canelo's willing to trade. Paterbiev is also in his mid-30s. I think that's a fascinating fight. They mentioned Callum Smith at 168 pounds. I think that's an interesting fight. But you want more lateral movement. You want a guy who has developed his legs throughout his career. Callum Smith's going to come in. I believe Callum Smith is going to try to trade with Canelo. I think Callum Smith has too much body for Canelo to hit. The guy who fascinates me at 168, let me name two. Caleb Plant, to me, gives Canelo all he can handle all he can handle. I think the lateral movement beats Canelo and Caleb Plant is quick twitch. He just fought a guy who tried to corner him in the ring. Who tried to employ the same game Canelo tried here. Right? You know, counters to the body and stuff like that. The subway guy, I'm forgetting his name right now. And Plant was just too dominant against that guy who was normally a light heavyweight. I think Plant would give Canelo all he can handle. Um, they mentioned Golovkin on the telecast. Hey, I'm always up for a trilogy with Golovkin, but let's be real here. Golovkin lost his last fight. If Canelo's even thinking about Golovkin, call up the Revianchenko. Understand boxing history. Revianchenko doesn't have to gain weight to fight Canelo. He could be the same weight he is. Canelo doesn't have to come down to 160. Canelo can say, hey, player, you come up, we'll fight for the title at 175, but you have to come in weighing whatever you weigh. I think he's an interesting fight because I think the Revianchenko plays angles well and stuff like that. Well, anyway, let me get back to being a dad here. Um... Also, I believe the best at 175 is Bivol. They were telling you, oh, Bivol's smaller, right? Well, Canelo is smaller. I, <laughs> to me, the zone was discounting fighters, and it was shocking because some of the guys they were discounting aren't the zone fighters, right? Also, Billy Joe Saunders. You want a guy who's a talker? You want a guy with an entourage who can enter the ring with Tyson Fury standing next to him? You want a guy who knows how to move for 12 rounds? You want a guy who's already disarmed people like Chris Eubank? All right, all right. Well, I'm going to get back to being a dad. Let me thank you for indulging me on this video. Brilliant performance by Canelo. Knockouts count. He won the fight. I thought he put to bed a fight that, had it gone the distance, would have been one of the more controversial fights of the last few years. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.